research. Um, the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust are actually one of the, um, uh, what's the word? Most like detailed data custodians for basking sharks. Your, um, your transects by the Silurian over the decades um, provided one of the most comprehensive data sets on their distribution, kind of independent of the public. Um, that's not to say the public data aren't as valuable. You'll see soon that they very much are, but having data collected by um, former wildlife transects, such as what the Silurian operate, um, really has transformed our understanding of this animal. So thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, I'll jump straight in. Uh, if you've got questions, um, put them in the chat. And then I think uh, um, having chatted with Siobhan, I'll probably do all the questions at the end. Um, but if there's something super important, then um, Siobhan can interrupt and I'll quite happily do questions as and when they come along. So I've called this talk um, New Insights into Barking Sharks in the Northeast Atlantic. That's because um, last year represented our 10th survey year. Um, it has been 11 years, but kind of COVID caused problems in 2020, uh, 2020 for all of us. Um, and, it, and it did for the Barking Shark Project too. But we're now a decade on from when a collaboration between the University of Exeter and Nature Scott started to build a better knowledge base about this animal to pull in all the different types of data that we could find so that we can more comprehensively preserve, conserve them um, from a basis of um, information and fact, um, which makes management that much easier when you've got kind of rock solid information. So here's what we found out over the past decade. So I'm just going to do some really basic stuff because I don't I don't know the broad um, suite of the audience. So I, I apologise if you know some of these bits. Um, but if you don't, then you should find it interesting. If you do know them, then it's a it's a good um, aid memoir. Well, in Latin, these sharks are known as Ceterinus Maximus. Um, and if you look back into the Greek, this really means sea monster nose big. Um, and I don't think that's too far from the truth. Um, these are some of the largest animals that we see in UK waters. Um, eight to 10 metres maximum length is, is achievable. And uh, I've seen some huge fish over the years, some very, very large animals that go under the boat that just keep on going and going and going. Um, so they're the largest fish in UK waters and they're the second largest fish in the world. And it's really interesting to note that both the first and second largest fishes in the world, so that's both the basking shark and the whale shark have, have um, evolved the same feeding mechanism. So they've all become um, plankton eaters largely. And, they, and if you think about whales, the, some of the largest whales in the world are also plankton eaters. So they've all evolved these strategies to make use of some of the food types that you might otherwise not go for and attain these huge masses from it. The conservation status um, this is done by the IUCN um, every few years. So that's the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And they produce a, a publication called the Red List. Um, and recently, the Barton Shark's been reappraised in the IUCN Red List process. And actually, the conservation status for this animal was variable across the world. Um, in some places, it was near threatened, other places endangered. Um, but actually, globally now, the animal's been moved down the scheme towards um, a more imperiled status of endangered globally, um, which is not great, actually. Um, we'd rather it were going in the other direction. Um, but in the UK um, and in Scotland, under its own legislations too, the animal is protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, so uh, irrespective of global legislation, of which there's not a great deal, the animal was most certainly protected in our waters from purposeful harassment. Uh, you can trade basking sharks, as in the parts of basking sharks, but it's so heavily licensed, it's called Appendix 2 license under CITES. CITES is the um, Convention on the International Trade of, Trade of Endangered Species, Fauna and Flora. Um, it's Appendix 2. So in principle, you could trade it, but in the UK, you can never catch it. And if you do want to trade it, it's so phenomenally detailed, you probably wouldn't bother or you would do it illegally. And around the world, however, there are very few population estimates for this species. And that, to some extent, is what was fed into what um, its more recent upgrade to the endangered status. Because without really good estimates of population size, we really don't know which direction this animal is going. 
um, improving or declining. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, these animals attain their huge mass and great body length over their lifetime through feeding on these small organisms. And I'm showing you here a picture of a small copepod. So it's a very tiny crustacean, even at its most adult stage, probably only be three, four, five meals at its absolute biggest. And there are two species that it prefers to eat. One's called Calanus finmarchicus, and that is distributed more in the northern parts of the UK. And there's also Calanus helgolandicus, which is distributed more in the southern parts of the UK. And there's what we call a biogeographical divide between these two species. And actually these two um, copepods, these two little food prey items for Barsham sharks, are responding quite differently to um, changes in water temperature. Um, and we'll, we'll touch about that later on. But they attain this great mass by eating these incredibly small organisms. Basking sharks have been in um, UK maritime history for millennia. Um, and we'd argue that they're an intrinsic part of our maritime natural and cultural heritage. It won't have escaped you that every year, like kind of late spring, early summer, when newspapers are quiet, again and again and again, you'll see reports in all of the newspapers about kind of the return of these gigantic sharks. They attract public attention. Some of them, attention is misguided. They're frequently um, mistaken for white sharks. Um, they definitely belong to the same family as white sharks. They're called lamnid sharks. These can be incredibly energetic creatures. And I'll show you a bit about their breaching behavior slightly later, which kind of proves that fact. But um, they're certainly part of our natural and cultural heritage. And, and for that reason alone, they deserve attention. And some may argue, as I would as a conservation biologist, they deserve um, preservation just because of their intrinsic value in, in our coastal ecosystems and what they do to help keep control of plankton. But they have been subject to wide scale historic hunting, particularly in the 20th century. And wide scale means hundreds of thousands of individuals being removed. And this was done systematically across the fringing countries of um, the Northeast Atlantic, in Ireland, in the UK, particularly in Scotland, and in Norway too. Um, and that large scale hunting has led to quite a strong decline. I'm showing you a figure here that was used um, in the CITES negotiations to have this species listed in the CITES Act um, under Appendix 2 to make the point that the animal was imperiled. And really what we needed to do was regulate international trade. And there's a few data series in this plot. The really dominant one, um, you've got Norway and Scotland, Southeast Ireland and Aku Island, which is um, part of Ireland too. Um, and you can, these, you've got year across the bottom here and the number of sharks taken. Um, and you can see quite strong peaks and troughs in the number of sharks that were taken. And I think that lightly mirrors the strong peaks and troughs we see in the seasonality even now. Um, but through time, if you add up all these sharks taken, it's easily over 100,000 individuals. And that led to systemic removal of the animal from across the Northeast Atlantic. And in part is why we now have a conservation status of um, endangered, which we've had for the Northeast Atlantic, but that's been replicated, that hunting has been replicated across the world particularly in places like New Zealand and California, um, and in places in Canada, where the populations of these sharks have never really um, substantially recovered. So uh, I would argue that for conservation to be effective, you need two types of information. You need kind of really good, high quality, broad scale information about where the sharks can be found, when the sharks can be found. But what you also need is really detailed information on their behavior at the individual level, as all populations uh, are built up of individuals. Uh, and so we need this kind of two pronged attack, create lots of really quite general information where you don't know if you're looking at the same individual again and again, but then also some really focused individual level studies. So you can start to learn of the behaviors of the animal at this individual level. And then I think when you come at it from these two directions, you build such a persuasive base of information that it becomes easier to um, argue for their conservation and not just to say, well, you must save these sharks, which is the correct sentiment, but needs more direction. 
But working in these two directions from the broad and from the fine scale, I think you can actually then start to say, you need to protect them doing X. Um, you need to take this measure because then those measures are focused, they're relevant, they're not generic. And it should in principle be easier to kind of buy into those management measures because they're based on some real relevant data. <coughs> Pardon me. So let's look then at the broad scale. And, and the talk is going to follow this broad scale through to fine scale now. So let's see if we can understand what goes on with bars and sharks around the UK for a couple of um, graphs I'll show you. And then we're going to specifically look at the Hebrides and, um, and then particularly inside the marine protected area for basking sharks. So where can you get good quality data? Well, you can get it from the accounts from the hunters. I showed you that previous graph that was used to persuade the CITES convention that the animal needed to have regulated trade rather than unregulated or unknown trade. Um, so the hunters data, while you might paint hunters as kind of the baddies in this whole conservation story, they do in fact collect very detailed data or did. And so that shouldn't really be turned down. Public sightings data are incredibly important because really the people represent the thousands of eyes on the coast looking and reporting animals that if you were to replicate that at a scientific grade or a scientific quality would be infinitesimally expensive and not achievable. So the public have a really important role both in pushing for the conservation of the animals individuals, but also creating the data that makes that argument persuasive. Boat-based surveys are incredibly important, such as um, I touched on that earlier on about the role that Silurian has played in the Inner Hebrides, and aerial surveys too. They provide really rapid oversight of everywhere all at once almost, which is a challenge with all of these other techniques where you can't be everywhere all at the same time, but within reason, an aircraft can. So let's look at the public sightings data. Well, there's more than three decades now of sightings data, more than 17,000 records. And these were held by the Marine Conservation Society, or I should say they held one of the largest databases. There are others, but we've had access to the MCS database. And in the past few years, the MCS has transitioned the custodianship of that data over to the Shark Trust, and now it's managed by them. So here I'm showing you a figure on the left-hand side these are all cleaned and validated and tidied data um, to some extent. Um, the more the figures go on, the more cleaner and cleaner the data get. But every single one of the black points on this map is a sighting of a barking shark over a 32, 33 year period. As you can see, there are more than 17,000 records in the Marine Conservation Society's data set. On the right hand side, we've split the data into five year chunks. And then we've just counted the number of black blobs that exist in these little cells and then colored the cells based on the number of sharks. And so it's not a particularly sophisticated way of looking at the information, but if you look where the brown cells are, the brown pixels, these generally tell you where the hotspots are of shark sightings. And you get from this that Scotland is a very important area. Um, so is the Isle of Man, and so is Southwest England, where, where I'm based. Um, and so that pattern, if you see that pattern repeat again and again and again, but through different types of survey data, it becomes even more persuasive that these are the real hotspots. Because um, each one of these data types, so public surveys or aerial surveys or boat surveys, carry biases. But when you bring multiple data sets together, you have kind of increasing confidence that those biases become less and less important. So that was the spatial pattern. So now let's look at look what's happened over the years. Um, and in the black bars here, this is the number of sightings in the Marine Conservation Society data set. And in the gray bars, these are the number of records in the Shark Trust data set. And, I, and you remember I told you that ownership of the database has transitioned over the last few years. Um, and so you, you should be able to recognize some peaks and troughs in these data sets. But probably what won't have escaped you is the really wide scale decline in the sightings of sharks in the past seven or eight years. Um, and this is also seen in some of the wildlife trust databases that operate in England, certainly for Cornwall. They similarly have seen wide scale um, disappearance of public records of sharks. 
Um, and there's a whole number of reasons for that, and we can touch on them later on. But this is the annual pattern. And pretty much, it seems like the UK reached the maxima or the most number of records in 2006. Um, and we've had a few other peaks and troughs, but certainly from 2014 onwards, something noticeable has happened with bass and shark sightings and that they've almost, well, largely disappeared. A, lo a lot of people ask me about, well, what's happening with um, climate change and basking sharks? And so I'm showing you a different type of figure here. You've got year across the bottom. And again, we're looking at the public sightings data, but what we're looking at is the, um, the, the earliest and latest days that sharks have been reported in the database. Um, so this kind of line at the bottom of the circles, this is telling us when in the spring are the sharks first seen. And then these squares at the top, this is pr pretty much what's the last day in the year sharks um, are last reported. And actually, you can see that the line kind of dances around a bit. But as we're moving maybe into the latter years, so more recent years, you could argue that the data series is becoming more noisy. You see these points are further apart. But that is in part a response to the ever decreasing amount of data that go in. And you might also say, well, these lines are starting to separate. So maybe the season for basking sharks is extending. So we're not only seeing them earlier in the season, but we're seeing them later into the season. But it's really, really hard to uh, come up with a robust answer about are these animals responding to climate change? Certainly their prey is. Um, Calanus copepods almost um, seem inevitably changing to climate because they're very small organisms and they react to water temperature um, and our water temperatures are most certainly changing. So it doesn't seem um, unlikely that sharks would respond as their prey responds. But at the moment, it's quite hard to see it with any great robustness in the public sightings data. So then let's zoom in on Scotland. Let's be really specific and have a look. And the rest of the talk now is all about our work in Scotland. So I'm showing you a set of figures here that looks at the annual pattern of shark sightings in this top plot, which is the Sea of the Hebrides Marine Protected Area. Um, so this is the new MPA that's been installed by um, Scottish government under support from NatureScot. Um, and this is the annual pattern of records. And we can see in recent years, there are very low numbers of records. Um, that's any record that sits inside this little blue polygon here. If we just look at Scotland as a whole to see whether or not what happens in the Sea of the Hebrides MPA differs to all of the rest of Scotland, the patterns actually aren't that dissimilar. Um, and so now these bars here are telling you about what happens in this kind of orange, pinky orange polygon. And you'll see you'll get this increase in 2006, and then you'll see it drop off. And you'll see another peak. It's a bit stronger outside of the MPA for 2013 and then you see it drop off again. And then just for context, I thought I'd show you the same pattern, but for the whole rest of the UK. So the only real differences between these three, these three um, plots are just the number of records considered, but they're all scaled to the same height. This all talking about a thousand records per year as the maxima. And you'll see the patterns broadly do the same thing. So we know that what goes on in the MPA in terms of Barton charts doesn't seem to be that different to what happens around the rest of the country um, year on year. The only real difference is just the sheer number of records. So looking then at um, what happens by month. So do we see sharks earlier elsewhere in the country? Um, and those types of questions, and we definitely do. So this is the same style of plot as the last one. And at the bottom, I'm showing you um, month across the bottom. So this is, um, January, February, March, April, May, June, all the way through October, November, December. And then um, the height of the bar is the proportion of records in the year that happen in June, or this one in July. And you can see for outside of Scotland, the peak month for bass and sharks is June, pretty much. And actually, if you just look in the southwest of the UK, it can almost extend into May. Um, in, for Scotland in general, very much matches what happens in the MPA and the Sea of the Hebrides. And you'll really see that the peak month is pretty much always August. And then it drops off really quite rapidly into September for the MPA. So what can we say then? Well, we can say that it doesn't seem like their pattern is necessarily changing 
with um, time of the year that they appear in. So it doesn't look like they're necessarily arriving earlier or later. And it does seem like that August is the main year. And it does seem like that what happens in the MPA is very much like what happens elsewhere. It's just in the MPA, the sharks are so much more concentrated that it makes it more likely that management measures would have a positive response on their conservation status. So let's look at a map then. Um, and you, many of these areas might be familiar to you. Here we've got the two main islands. Here we've got on the west, we've got Tyree. And on the east, we've got Col. Up here, we've got Rum. We've got the Outer Hebrides fringing here on the western side, mainland Scotland on the west, on the eastern side, we've got Sky to the north here, and you've got Mull down at the bottom here. And what I've plotted on for you are all of the public sightings of basking sharks. And the coloured um, pattern in the background is telling you about the density. So where you see the darker, redder colours, that's where the sightings are more and more dense. So these are all public records. And what you should really take from this picture is that it seems like Col and Tyree are very important areas. It's very red there, very dense with public sightings. The same for here for Rum. Um, and you've got some rock systems out here in a lighthouse called Heisker. Um, and there and at Mill Rocks, we see some incredibly large animals. We see sharks off the back of muck and egg. Um, and we also see them from the headlands of this northern part of Mull here. Um, and so all of these areas independently kind of emerge from the data as being areas of high public sightings. So you might say, well, that's great, but the public are biased. They're only out there in the summer when it's pleasant. Um, maybe these data aren't telling us the most, most giving us the most truthful picture of their biology. Well, here comes a map of data from the Hebridean Wild and Dolphin Trust. And what I've done, so in the background of this map that you can't see are all the transit lines that the Silurian has sailed over the many years. And we've taken the points where they've seen the basking sharks and we've counted those points and put them on a colored grid for you. So the Silurian isn't going specifically where basking sharks go. That's not the function of that vessel. So we know then that we, we're not accidentally reinforcing these areas as being important because we keep going back to them again and again. The vessel goes here because it wants to cite cetaceans. And so when then you see these hotspots emerge to the west of Tyree, to the north of Canna, Millstone and Heisker, um, you, you could be a little bit more confident that these are starting to reflect the real biology of the species. Um, and this is now what I'm talking about, about building the data sets to be really comfortable that we know what the true pattern of this of the distribution of basking sharks is. You may have heard also of another boat-based survey, <coughs> excuse me, and this is often cited. Many meetings I go to about basking sharks, people always talk about this kind of heralded survey. It was a survey done by a company commissioned by a wind farm developer that wanted to prospect and put a wind farm out to the west of Tyree. And so they sent out a boat to do a wildlife survey. And every single one of these points is of a sighted basking shark. They did this survey over two days. So some of these animals could be the same animals, but they counted 903 sharks on, from 332 observations in about 36 hours. Um, and this, this, this survey is yeah, mentioned to me a lot. The reason I put this up is because, again, this isn't so much an independent data series, but it is an incredibly good wildlife survey taken with where the data has been gathered from a very high vantage point on a boat. And so you can be fairly sure that these are quite high quality data. But I do have to keep reminding people this was done on two days. So many of these observations um, could indeed be uh, the same shark seen twice. But nonetheless, you can't deny there are an awful lot of sharks there. This is one of the most useful surveys we've had for conveying to people quite how many sharks might actually aggregate to the west of Tyree every summer. The final survey technique I'm going to talk about is aerial surveying. And I think it was recognised by Nature Scott or Scottish Natural Heritage as they were at the time, that aerial surveys would provide what you might think of as the gold standard in surveying techniques to try and understand basking sharks in the Inner Hebrides. 
So here's that same map of the inner Hebrides, but I've changed the data inside. These blue lines are the lines flown by an aircraft fitted with digital photographic equipment. So it doesn't rely on somebody kind of looking out of a window, pressing a button on a little GPS whenever they see a shark. The flight lines are flown and then the data are watched back in the office and basking sharks are detected. And you'll notice there's two zones to this. There's this kind of bluer zone in the um, center. And in this region, the aerial survey line density was increased. They put more transects in because they had more um, intelligence that this is likely a high density area. And actually the surveys didn't reveal a huge number of sharks. And that shows you the challenge with aerial surveys in that they're incredibly expensive. When you fly them on the right day, they're absolutely perfect but you never know when the right day is. You can't predict the weather. You don't know how the sharks are necessarily gonna behave. This survey definitely did detect sharks, but it didn't detect sharks in the numbers that we thought it might. But this is the absolute gold standard in wildlife biology at sea, if you want to estimate a population of animals. And what's really important with this aerial survey too, is that we also have all of the information from the electronic tags that we've been putting on sharks that I'll tell you about. And they tell you very closely um, or very directly what proportion of time those animals spend at the surface. And so you know if the aerial survey goes over at 1 p.m., what proportion of sharks are likely to be sightable at 1 p.m. if they're at the surface. Um, and so it's really, these are, this is a really good survey technique, incredibly expensive. If we could do aerial surveying everywhere, you absolutely would to aid the decision around management and uh, estimation of numbers, but that's not feasible because um, of cost. But I would say that Scottish Natural Heritage and Nature Scott have been incredibly progressive around the issue of this MPA and in the, um, their foresight to collect information, to take risks, to spend money, to build the knowledge base so that when they come up with the management plans in the years to come, they're absolutely built on rock solid information. So you put all of these surveys techniques together, but you still get patches, you still get holes of information. And so what can you do? Well, actually, you can use some quite clever statistics and environmental data on temperature and chlorophyll and all sorts of things about plankton to pull together and make an estimate. And what I'm showing you here is, is the estimate of potential persistence. So it's a colored scale from blue where the statistics and all of the raw data suggest actually doesn't matter how much you're going to look, you're not probably likely to see a basking shark. And the cells that are in red are estimates of where you're most likely to see basking sharks. And the good thing is, is if you collected lots of information in um, some areas and not in others, you can infer what I think the chance of seeing sharks will be in areas where you didn't survey that hard because you didn't have enough money, we didn't have enough coverage. Um, and it's this type of approach where you bring in all these pieces of information together, kind of put them in the big washing machine, and then you get these really nice layers of information that are consistent, that can then can help you talk about where the animal might be found. Um, this, this piece of work was done by Scottish Natural Heritage. It was the analysis came out of the Sea Mammal Research Unit and um, CREAM, which is the Centre for Research and Environment. I've forgotten the rest of their acronym, environmental modelling. They're based at St Andrews. They are, I would say, Europe's leading institute to do that type of statistical analysis for marine data. Um, and they were asked to do that for the MPA. Um, in my own research group, we've obviously had lots of access to Barsh and Shark data now. We've been running environmental prediction models to look more broadly than just Scotland um, and also to look on the other side of Scotland. Um, and so what I'm showing here is a figure that I took from one of the research papers done by one of my students, Rebecca Austin, who now works for the Joint Nature Conservation Committee. So she's moved into a conservation role. Um, and what you can see from these maps is wherever it's dark green, we're predicting um, uh, that the habitat there is the most suitable for basking sharks. And thankfully, the models predict in areas where we've worked, which is useful and makes you feel a bit more confident. We never gave the models information about the Isle of Man, but it has predicted areas around the Isle of Man. And we didn't give the model that produced these answers any knowledge 
of um, basket sharks on the east coast of Scotland, but you definitely get them there. And the model's done quite a good job of predicting a uh, habitat that's very suitable to support sharks. What we were really keen on is finding areas where we hadn't known, we didn't know about. And one of the boxes here, number four, is this kind of um, area to the north of the wash. Um, I'd be fascinated to know whether sharks are seen there or not. I've had some reports from fishermen that say that infrequently they'll capture them in nets and release them in this area. Um, but from a planning and conservation perspective, one of the reasons for running the model was also to look at the placement of wind farms. And these polygons here, these black, black um, odd shapes, are the footprints of wind farms. And we've plotted the wind farms on top of the prediction surface where Barton shots might be. And actually, you can see they've done a fairly good job at picking habitat that seems to have a moderately low um, uh, goodness, we'll call it goodness, for Barton sharks in terms of habitat quality. Um, yeah. So that's all broad scale information. And there are lots of graphs there. I promise there's a lot more figures in the next, uh, a lot more pictures in the next bit. Um, so we've worked at the population level now. We've looked at seasonal patterns, annual patterns, spatial patterns, patterns maybe with a um, year in terms of their phenology, as in when they arrive in a season. But what about the individuals? Well, the only real way you can get individuals is really to use techniques such as satellite tracking. And it's the satellite tracking project that we started with Nature Scott in 2012. Um, and here I'm showing you a basking shark um, swimming forwards. Um, this is my colleague, Dr. Lucy Hawkes, who runs the project with me. She's leant over the side of the boat, and here she's trying to get a DNA sample off of this shark. And I'll tell you a bit more about DNA in a moment. So to quickly summarize on that project, just to give you a feeling of the level and intensity of work, to date we've electronically tagged 82 sharks um, over the decade. We've used five different technology types. And we've been out at sea for nine years, uh, um, or nine separate seasons across nine years. We've worked at five sites trying to deploy these tags at Ghana Sound, which is the area between Colin and Tyree, at Scary Ball, which is a lighthouse out here to the southwest, at High Skin, which is a lighthouse here up in this sector of the MPA, Cairns of Coll, which is off the back of Coll here on the eastern side, and Halls Bank, which is along this dash uh, 50 metre contour here. And these are our hotspots. We visit those sites every year that we're out in an attempt to find sharks, because the data seems to suggest they're the key bits where we should be looking. We've used three boats, um, two operators and three skippers to do our work. And we've spent six cumulative months of time at sea. Um, Nature Scott has funded all of the equipment and resources. The university has funded all of the staff time. But in 2016, MCS funded tags along with a private donor. And in 2019, the World Wildlife Fund funded um, robotics work, which I'm going to tell you about. Um, but all of this work is really only possible because of the three excellent skippers that are licensed under my um, Nature Scott license so that we're allowed to approach the sharks. Um, my colleague Lucy and I and the PhD students that worked on the project, we're all experts in our field of data analytics and wildlife tracking, but it's the absolute excellence of those skippers to get us onto those sharks in a safe and effective manner that's made this project happen. And so um, this is just a sincere thanks to them really because this project wouldn't be what it is without their absolute dedication because some days at sea, it is incredibly frustrating. Um, here's a picture of all the tags we've used. Um, I put a red box around all the ones we've used. The ones that don't have red boxes, I put on for context. These are the types of tags we might use on birds. Um, but sharks being quite large, um, certainly bastard sharks, um, can take somewhat larger tags. Um, and so this top tag here is the absolute state of the art in animal wildlife tracking. It's $5,000 plus VAT. And it has on board GPS, a depth sensor, so it's a dive computer, temperature sensors. It communicates in real time to overpass some satellites when it's at the surface. It can also allow you to position the fish when the fish is under the water. Um, moving kind of down from that, at the very other end of the scale is this tag here. This is called a spot five. Now it's been upgraded to spot six. This has been the workhorse of the satellite tracking project. We've put out over 60 of these. Um, and these tags are just simple location-only tags. When the shark is at the surface, 
this tag will send a message blindly up into the atmosphere in the hope that one of the six satellites that communicate with these tags is available and listening for the information. And then the other tags I've circled all do different types of things, the position tags, underwater tags, all sorts of things. But this is the absolute state of the art at $5,000 plus VAT. This is the one we've deployed the most of at $2,000 plus VAT. And here are some pictures of how we go about doing it. So every animal we approach, we use a pole camera um, uh, under the surface that we look at the undercarriage of the shark because we want to know what sex it is. We want to know if it's a male or a female and get a good idea of body size. So all sharks approached have this kind of camera probing around at the back of the animal to try and see if we can see claspers because claspers, the presence of these kind of long organs that are used in mating, dangling out the back of the animal, tell you it's a male. Absence of claspers pretty much tell you it's a female. Um, all sharks that we satellite track where we can, we try and get a DNA swab from them. So this is Philip Doherty here, my PhD student from a few years ago. He was working on the project. He's deploying a satellite tag at the front right of the dorsal fin. And this is the um, this is my colleague. He was one of um, Phil's supervisors along with this is Lucy Hawks again. She's leaning in doing a DNA swab. And the bottom left-hand corner is what our darting pole. So here's one of these spot six or spot five tags I was talking about. This is a fresh new one. It's got its biofouling, anti-fouling paint on it. It's strung on a darting pole and there's the dart at the end. And all this work is licensed by the UK Home Office. Um, so it can't be done by anybody. You've got to go on a whole range of training. Um, there's about a 40 page license that goes along with this that I had to write. Um, and we're, we're um, monitored very closely directly by the Home Office, the animal, Animals and Science Regulation Unit. I'm going to show you a video now of how this all works. So this is Lucy's arm here. This is a shark we're approaching. And in the background, you can hear one of our graduate research associates, Owen, um, guiding Lucy in into the animal and feeding information back to the skipper, who's quite a way behind in the boat. Here goes. Dead ahead. Slightly to port, very slightly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's a shark tag. That is probably the easiest shark we have ever tagged. And it's probably why I'm showing you it on video because I think it is the cleanest demonstration of how we do it. Very slow approach, dead slow speed, like dead, dead slow speed to the point where the shark doesn't really know we're there. And then that is very calm water as well. Slow approach and then a slow dart. And if you do that, then the shark reacts and what you see, it swims off. It, we've clearly disturbed that animal. We, we couldn't deny that we haven't disturbed it, but actually the disturbance level in that situation is really rather low when you consider the types of data that that electronic tag then provides. And here's an example. So you've got um, the tip of a dorsal fin of a bastion shark. The shark is swimming from the bottom right-hand corner of the screen up to the top left. And you can just see the satellite tag here trailing in the background. And it's up at the surface here. So if it's up at the surface, it's transmitting every 60 seconds. And if one of the six satellites that's specifically designed to listen for the signals from these tags is available, they're polar orbiting, so they're not always available. Um, you'll hear the messages and try and work out a position for your animal. We're not the true pioneer of this in any sense. The real pioneer is a, is a gentleman called Professor Monty Preet, who's unretired now, spent many years at Aberdeen University. And he tagged the very first basking shark or attempted to tag it in the very late seventies. Um, and it didn't go so well. I mean, it was prototype technology. The tag was 1.2 meters long. Um, our tags are now 30 centimeters long at most. That's our longest tag. Some of our smaller tags are 15 centimeters long um, and our tags weigh 50 grams at most. Their tag was, I, I don't know, probably a good kilo, I would have thought. Um, and what actually happened during this tagging event that this picture shows up and showing you now is the tar the shark whacked the boat, um, broke the, the boat and left the, the um, researchers in the water until another boat picked them up. And that is now why we'll, we won't tag from ribs. Um, I just don't think it's worth it. Um, it's challenging tagging them from a hard boat. I, I don't deny that, but I wouldn't want to create an incident where we have something like that happen 
and then there kind of be retribution against the animal because it was seen to kind of disturb us. Um, so we do all our work from a hard boat where it's much safer for us and for the animal. So what do those tags show us? Well, here I'm showing you four maps. These are four different sharks. I've picked these because they show a good demonstration of animals not really leaving the MPA. So the white star is the deployment location and the black star is the location at the end of tagging. So this tag stayed on for 21 days and the animal didn't really go anywhere, stayed the west of Tyree. This shark on the right here, tagged it here at the White Star to the west of Tyree, but it went all the way north. It came through Gunner Sound. It looks like it went back through Gunner Sound again, popped up to the north of Col, went up to the Cairns, over to, that is Egg Muck, Muck, I think. Um, and then uh, back again, and then the tag finally came off over here over 55 days. Um, these are more shorter action tags. I'm gonna talk about longer ones in a moment. And these other two patterns are similar, but they do different things. But you'll see once we've set, um, once we've tagged them, they show residency to the to the area. While those ones showed residency, these other sharks actually move further. So here I'm showing you animals that range out of the marine protected area and start to move towards the coast of Northern Ireland, um, and then go back again. And these are over longer periods. So this is 62 days, 49 days. The coloring of the points is just the progressing time of the track. As you move from blues into oranges, into yellows, into greens, the track is getting longer and longer. So you can see that not only did we show animals staying in the same place um, in the previous figure here, we've also showed you animals that for about the same amount of time did a lot of wandering around. So when you start to pull all of those data together, what I'm showing you across the top here are all the different positions we got out of the satellite tags, telling us where the sharks were for each of the years. And I've just drawn a really simple box around the most outerly locations. And you can see from those tags that we put out, they've ranged quite widely, right the way over to the coast of North Ireland and Northern Ireland. If you just count the positions using a grid, you can start to see hot spots emerge. So these hotspots are now independent of us. Our only interaction with the animal is the moments that we put the tag on. And if you use another approach, a kernel, which is a bit like this gridding approach, but slightly different, again, these hotspots reveal. So what we can show now is that there are persistent summer hotspots that form, that are formed by the sharks um, to the west of Tyree, in Gunner Sound, and to some extent at Cairns of Cole. So knowing what the sharks do in Scotland is really important, but what we've also been doing is supporting the Isle of Man um, research group that work on barton sharks. Um, we learned a lot from them in the early years about how to approach sharks, but they were using a different type of tag. We took to them our types of tag and they gave us tagging techniques. So we had this really nice kind of exchange of um, knowledge and sharing. And that also led to us co-supervising a student, Hayley Dalton. Um, and this is her piece of work looking at Sharks that were initially tagged into the Isle of Man, but then were subsequently found to go up to the MPA. Um, and somewhat like Colin Tyree and the Inner Hebrides get summertime hotspots from their public data and from their tracking data. These two plots on the right here, the A and B, these show you the hotspots again of public sightings data and satellite tracking data, both telling you this broadly the same types of things that hotspots form in the summer months. So these sharks then disappear around about September, October, um, and they go deep. And going deep means the satellite transmitters can't send you location data anymore because you can't transmit through the water. But what does happen in the spring is the sharks come back up to the surface again. But what's actually happened is the sharks have moved south over the winter. And here are four plots figures for you, showing you the white star is where the sharks re-emerge in the spring. And then the colored points show you the northward migration of these animals as the spring progresses and they move into the summer. And these four sharks were all tagged up in the um, Sea of the Hebrides. And then they kind of disappeared, dropped off the radar. They've reappeared south and then they've moved up. And for these two southern fish here, sorry, these two plots in the bottom, you'll see these sharks actually stopped off in Ireland that year and did their summer period in Ireland. 
Whereas this shark here did its summering in the Celtic Sea, but this shark on the right here, shark B, came all the way back to the location where we tagged it the previous year. I mean, that was the first real strong indication that shark, the same sharks come back again and again to Scotland. We, as well as satellite tracking, we've been using genetics. Um, we don't do genetics in, our, in mine and Lucy's research group. We understand the role of conservation genetics, but we're not geneticists. So what we've been doing is supporting conservation geneticists to do the work. And here's a figure from a research paper by Lillian Lieber, who was at Aberdeen and is now at Queens in Belfast, I believe. I um, mean, Lillian used genetics. Um, and I'm going to show you mostly this plot here on the left, top left, where it says SCO for Scotland. This is the same shark that was sampled on subsequent years. So we've DNA swabbed it like this picture shows you. We've DNA swabbed this in year one, which was 2012, and then again in year two, which was 2013. But we had no idea it was the same shark. To us, it was just another really large gray animal, gray basking shark. It's only when you did genetic fingerprinting was it revealed that we had operated on, not operated, we'd worked with the same animal in subsequent years. So alongside the satellite tracking, this figure here for Finn, this shark called Finn, showing you the animal came back. This picture here is further demonstration that these animals are returning again and again. Um, and this time it's revealed through genetics. What they found actually across all of the sites that they worked at, so this is in the west of Scotland, the east of Scotland, in Ireland and in the Isle of Man, is that the sharks that group in these areas are more genetically related to each other than random. Um, and so what it would seem to suggest is that there's some propensity for these animals to re-aggregate to the same spots each year. But we think there's a certain degree of flexibility. And so they will move between sites, but there certainly seems um, that their, um, their positioning is not random. So they're coming back to the same locations year on year. Or if it's not every year, it's every fourth year, every fifth year. But that return every so often is enough to kind of um, reveal itself in the genetics and the breeding biology of these animals. So following the summer, where do these sharks go then? Well, I showed you that picture of the sharks moving north in the spring, but in the very height of the winter, what we've done is we've taken the exclusive economic zones of Denmark, so this is the Faroe Islands, the UK, um, Ireland, France, Spain, Portugal, um, Portugal here, this is for Madeira, and this is Morocco, and coloured these areas based on the number of satellite tracking locations we got. And what we found is that pretty much a majority of the sharks that are tracked from Scotland will spend their winters to the west of Ireland. They'll distribute across other countries too, but for the most, animals will be to the west of Ireland. And when you look to the right-hand side on this more fine scale gridding, you can see where you get dark blues. This is the greatest number of locations. They're just off the shelf edge. This, this gray thick line here is the 200 meter depth contour. And so what the sharks are doing is moving out of Scotland to the west of Ireland, sitting a little bit deeper in the water column and just off the continental shelf. So if you want to find a Barton shark in the winter at depth, this would be a good place to look. Sharks can make really long range movements too. Um, and here I'm showing you maps of animals that did quite exceptional movements. Um, here, this is a movement of animals down to Madeira and down into the Canary Islands. This is on the left hand side here. These are tags, sharks tagged in Scotland. On the right hand side, I'm showing you a picture of sharks tagged in the Isle of Man, but they moved down to Morocco and they moved all the way up to Norway. And what is fascinating about the stuff on the right hand side here is we've seen sharks come back to Scotland in the summer again and again. What Hayley Dalton and the team in the Isle of Man, Jackie and Graham Hall, what they showed is sharks going back to the same wintering spots. And for this one shark, it was a wintering spot off Morocco. Um, so not only have we shown fidelity to summering sites, we're now showing fidelity to wintering sites. And if you wanted to look at what a full year round migration might look like, here's just two examples I've picked you. The points are colored by months of the year. And you can see that animals just wander around during the winter. They're not necessarily in Scotland, but they're making movements, searching for food, spending time, doing whatever they do. On the left, you've got this example of an animal that kind of leaves Scotland, 
goes a bit out to the west of Ireland, comes back again, goes down into the Irish Sea, comes back north again, and then goes much further west of Scotland. Um, and uh, this animal on the right hand side, you can see this animal has done something a bit different. It's left Scotland, gone to the west of Ireland and done a big super loop of Ireland, come back up through the Irish Sea in November, popped out to the top and spent much of then the rest of the winter to the, to the west of Ireland um, and Scotland um, off the continental shelf. But not all sharks go deep in the winter. And I'm showing you a plot here of another shark that we tracked with a real-time satellite tag because this shark did something very different. And we only saw this on the 65th shark we tagged. And we followed this shark pretty much all the way through the winter with the animal at the surface off of Portugal. Um, these green dots are the real time locations of this shark. Um, and all the way through the November to May period, we received all this information from this animal um, off the Iberian region before the tag finally detached to the west of the Canary Islands in the October which is 13 months after it was first put on up here in Scotland in September. So the point of showing you this one is, is you think you might have described everything, but then something quite new comes along unexpectedly. So I've spoken to you a lot about location data, but now we understand the timing of the, these animals and where they might go. We were challenged by Nature Scott to understand more of their subsurface behaviour. What exactly are they up to? And so we've developed camera tags that look at behavior under the water. We've been using advanced movement tags to look at accelerometry of animals and breaching, and we've been using robotics. So what types of questions have we been asking with these more advanced tags? A bit like how much time do you spend feeding? Do we see courting and breeding? What about breaching behavior? Do we see that? Questions like what's their daily energy budget? Um, and what could all those data mean for management? What are the proximate threats um, that we can see from those data? Um, what would be the consequences of these animals being disturbed? And ultimately, really, what technologies can help answer all of those things? So I'm going to look at three of them for you. These are our camera tags. So they have a camera looking forwards and a camera looking in reverse. They're attached to the animal for about three days. They auto detach transmit from their antenna, their location, and then we set off on a boat and go and find the tag, pick it up out of the water and download the data. And here's what we see. So this is a little compilation of video data from six sharks. So we've seen midwater swimming, which you might imagine for this animal, when it's not at the surface, where else could it be? Well, most people believed it was midwater, but what these cameras have really revealed it's a huge amount of time these animals spend swimming along the seabed. Could be 70, 80% of their time is on the seabed, not at the surface at all, and not mid-water. Swimming over sandy seabeds, kelp seabeds. But what we really saw that excited us the most with this early morning group behavior, which has never been described for this animal. Um, very, very slow movement, deeply packed, there's about, we think we can count 11 other sharks in one of the video sequences. All of these animals grouped together. It's like, I'm anthropomorphizing, but it's like they're holding hands. So they're very gentle with each other. You might imagine if you saw these types of behaviors in other animals, it would be leading to courting. But we also saw that with basking sharks attracting shoals of fish and these fish using a basking shark as a habitat to clean themselves. So that, that was quite a phenomenal set of data. Here are some static pictures for you. I've just picked these out just as I thought they were interesting. Here's an animal swimming across the seabed. You've got another example of a shark over a different type of habitat. So this is a bit more rocky. Picture in C here of group behavior. Because the cameras look backwards, you can also look at their pooing, their defecation rates, which is really interesting from energy budgets. Top right here in E, you can see the camera seeing other sharks. So you can start to look at social behaviors. Here in picture F, you can see the shark's gills are flared. So it's doing, it's potentially feeding subsurface. G is a really interesting picture around proximate threats. This is a plastic bag. We put this camera out and within an hour, it picked up a plastic bag. And for the entire uh, three day duration, there's just this plastic bag rubbing backwards and forwards across the lens, making the data almost unusable. Um, but then also you can see an H here, fish coming up to the basking shark, 
nibbling off little parasites and using that sharp skin as a cleaning surface. So one of the reasons for showing you this is this kind of when they're out of sight, they're not out of mind. So just because you don't see them at the surface doesn't mean they're not in the area because pretty much all of these pictures, apart from this one in E, shows you this animal subsurface. Um, so not being at the surface is not a surefire indicator they're not in the area where you might be. The cameras have been really good as well for helping us to understand our influence on these sharks. There's always the observer effect. It can be really problematic. What these two plots show you is how these animals respond to electronic tags, because the cameras allow us to count the tail beats, the rapid um, left and right of the tail. And we call that tail beat frequency. And Hertz means the number of left rights per second. And largely what you can see in the moments following tagging, as soon as the tag goes on, the animal tail beat frequency is incredibly rapid. And then by about five minutes following tagging, you see this tail beat amplitude start to return to normal. And by nearly half an hour after the tagging event, we don't seem to see any other drop in tail beat frequency. So we think we, we certainly have an impact on these animals when we tag them, but we're of the opinion that our impact is fairly short lived. So I spoke to you about movement tags. Um, and so this yellow tag here, these are accelerometers. So these are like your mobile phones. They have very sensitive sensors in them that help um, the tag understand its attitude um, and its direction and the force, the G-force that's being applied. And we put these on to look at breaching behavior. And here's a picture at the bottom. This was taken by my colleague Owen, um, showing a shark with one of the yellow tags attached. These tags also auto detach. Um, and the work was all written up by our student, Jess Rudd, who's now working with us for a PhD. And this map on the left hand side shows you all the satellite positions of the shark. But what we also managed to do is figure out when that shark was at the surface and was breaching. And that's what these red dots are. And see, we were very much looking for an independent way to ascertain where breaching happens, because we think that's where courting might happen. And what's fascinating about this map is it's this contour here, this 50 meter depth contour, and this area here where we frequently see breaching. And of course, all of this information on breaching was created when we weren't there. We'd put the tag on and then we left. This tag was on for 30 days, gathering information, and this animal was breaching in the areas where we had seen breaching before, which is really, really helpful. It gives you much more kind of independent information. So here's me with the, with the darting pole. And this is the type of behavior that Barton sharks are doing. They're throwing themselves out of the water. And all of these kind of other small graphs are showing you um, an event where we recorded four um, simultaneous breaches of this animal throwing itself out of the water again and again and again. And you can see the animal started at 25 meters depth, swimming along the seabed, and then just suddenly rockets up to the surface, throws itself out of the sea, rolls over like this, falls back down, goes back down to 10 meters and then starts the ascent again, drops back down, starts the ascent again, drop back down, starts the ascent again. Um, each time kind of burning energy. And we can look at the tail beat amplitude. We know that by the time it's starting to make its, it, its ascent, it's doing around about um, four to six beats per second. Um, no, that can't be right. Oh, amplitude, sorry, it's the strength of the beat. So the tail beat as you're propelling yourself up to the surface is really quite extensive. Um, and we can look at speed in meters per second. But largely it was to build this idea about where's breaching happening because we think breaching is an important sign for breeding. And then I'm just gonna talk about the last method now that we've used to more deeply understand the behavior subsurface. We've also used advanced robotics. This is an autonomous system. Um, up on the top right hand corner, you can see this is an electronic tag. This is fitted to the shark and this robotic system is clever enough to follow the shark and it follows the shark by following the beacon. And here's the type of video it produces. So the robot has five cameras mounted on it, looking in the five different directions that you just saw there. And this robot is heading out entirely under its own steam. It's got some simple rules of engagement with the tag. 
um, to ensure that the robot doesn't make contact with the animal. Um, and this is the type of um, videography we managed to gather. So you can see that this was a male shark. You can just see the clasp was out the back there. There was a lamprey there as well, but that's too floppy. You could see these kind of rigid structures. Here's the robot moving over the top of the shark. There you can see the electronic tag that the robot is following. And a broader shot. This, so this provides really helpful context. So we've seen this from the towed camera systems we put on the animals, but to actually see these much wider kind of scenic shots really helps you to conceive what the animals are swimming through. Um, this is a male, you can see the shark clasp is there, that loose thing there is a lamprey. You can also see these sharks have interacted with nets somewhere. You've got net cuts on the top of the dorsal fin there or rope cuts. You can see this very strong like knife structure, a very sharp structure in the tail, in the tail area there. That's what makes this a laminid shark, that very sharp edge there, very characteristic of laminids with that tail stock. So the laminids being like um, members of the white sharks um, and other kind of uh, poor beagles, which are a smaller version. and then the shark up at the surface and the robot following it. So the advanced robotics really gave us another entire different viewpoint of these sharks and what they're doing. Um, and a bit like the towed camera system, here are some static images showing you um, the shark in different positions. So at the surface feeding, um, feeding again slightly subsurface with a uh, dorsal just knifing, um, fish following the shark in the background. So then just to summarize, I've been talking about an hour now. Um, what does the research reveal? Well, to summarize really the satellite tracking, the boat surveying, the habitat modeling, the genetics, all those techniques have rapidly improved our knowledge. But the sum of those things has been more than any one part. The greatest insight has definitely been gained from merging the data and working in partnership. And that's partnership with the public through public sightings data, through um, naturalists, through scientists, through policy advisors at Nature Scott. Ultimately, what do Barton Sharks demonstrate? Well, a very high degree of variability in their behavior, but they demonstrate residency to the Sea of the Hebrides at multiple scales, days, weeks, months, and then over years. We definitely know the groups we encounter are genetically related. They're certainly more related than random. And I would say that Scotland appears critical for the future of the species. Scotland and the Sea of the Hebrides in my opinion, is Europe's most important basking shark hotspot. Um, and from my knowledge of the literature around the world, I don't think I see other people talking about basking sharks in such numbers as we do there. Um, and so I think the, the, the MPA therefore is incredibly important, hopefully for securing the future for that animal. What we really need to get a handle on at the moment is group behavior. And we're working hard towards that and an estimation of numbers a good population size estimate. And then that will allow us to understand what the relevant threats are for management. But we should remember the threats now are different than in the past. I spoke to you very much about direct hunting. That isn't a real threat to the animal now. What are the real threats? Well, in, in my mind, they're climate change and how we're changing their food. It's fisheries bycatch um, in trawlers. Like I've shown you images here of fisheries bycatch happening but also disturbance, um, people visiting the sharks frequently in areas where they might be seeking to mate. So we need to better understand this group behaviour to know whether disturbance is really an issue for them or not. Thank you very much.